Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. President, can I thank you for inviting me to speak at the world's foremost university debating forum, perhaps with just one exception. But can I also... <laughs> we'll get there, we'll get there. There can be no greater responsibility for an MP or for members of Parliament than to commit troops to battle. And that is why I suggest to you that it is very important we draw a distinction between counter-terrorism and wider military intervention, which is implied in this motion. The first, or the former, I can sign up to, provided it is based on sound intelligence. So we do, and can, take the battle to terrorism. But I cannot sign up to the wider concept of military intervention uh, when it comes to Daesh at the moment for a variety of reasons, but one of the key ones is that our past interventions in Iraq, in Helmand and in Libya have been a shambles. They've been a shambles and the cost has been dear, both in lives, in treasure and in international reputation. This is not the military's fault. It is a political and diplomatic failure to understand the events on the ground. Now, let us be clear, there are no easy answers, or very few easy answers in foreign policy nowadays. There's very few black and white cases. A lot of just a series of hard decisions and choices. And as such, we must learn from the error of our ways for fear of repeating them when it comes to combating this most evil of terrorist organizations that is called Daesh. Let me make my position clear, if I may. I was referred to as a serial rebeller. Yes, I have opposed our interventions. I resigned as a shadow minister to vote against the Iraq war. I was one of the few on our side to oppose our intervention in Helmand. I was the only Conservative MP to vote against continuing policy, the government's continuing policy in Afghanistan, and indeed the only Conservative MP to vote against our Libyan intervention as well. I led the campaign from the Conservative side in 2013 against the government idea of arming the rebels, which then, at least in small quantities, included Daesh, and then in 2015, again, led the campaign across all parties, in many respects, against actually the government decision to change sides, in essence, and uh, bomb uh, Daesh. Now, history, so you can probably gather from that, and when you take into account that I've also opposed my own government in arguing, actually, for stronger defence, because I believe these interventions have been a gross distraction from the bigger danger, and that is sovereign states, not necessarily friendly to the West, both rearming and reasserting its power and influence. So I hope you've gathered from that that I'm not on my WIPS Christmas card list. But I do believe in a just war, and I do believe that we've got to combat terrorism. And the argument or the point put forward previously that this is a pacifist line is a little below the belt. Some of us have medals to prove that actually we're not pacifists at all. Now, history suggests that if we are going to take up military intervention, then certain clear goals have to be set. We must have a defined and achievable objective. We must have appropriate and sustainable force. We've got to have a long-term and comprehensive strategy, military, economic, and political. And we've got to have an exit strategy. And the reason why Iraq, Helmand, and indeed Libya have turned into the shambles they have is that we have not adhered 
to those goals. You have been so persistent, sir, and everybody has refused you. <laughs> I have decided to give you a go. A duty exists to create a better situation than went before. And the lessons from our previous military interventions is that those interventions have actually caused more harm. So we have a duty to think this through clearly, which is why we have got to clearly define our objectives, make sure we can see them through, but above all, make sure that there is a political process as well. Because soldiers can only buy time it is the politicians and the diplomats who actually need to provide the long-term solution. And sometimes we forget that point. I'm going to just carry on, but I'll try to remember you're up there. Okay. Um, I think one of the reasons that we've had such an unfortunate series of interventions which have proved failures is that not only have we not adhered to those core principles, but also, we've actually been poorly informed. There has been a lack of information on the ground, and this is partly because of a lack of funding to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. But let's look at those decisions very quickly. In Iraq, we went to war. There can be no doubt we went to war on a false premise. There were no WMD. The decision Chilcot has got to come to is, we all accept we were deceived, but were, did number 10 intentionally deceive us. When it comes to Afghanistan, I supported the initial deployment in 2001. That was sound policy to defeat Al-Qaeda. We achieved that goal very quickly. But the mission then morphed into one of nation building, which was a complete and utter disaster. We did not have the resources to see that through. And in confusing the mission, we confused the enemy, because in Al-Qaeda's place came the Taliban. And in Libya, our mission again morphed into one of regime change, and we created an utter mess, if you like, with our intervention. So I would argue that we need a comprehensive and long-term strategy, and one of the biggest lessons of those interventions is that that must be in place. Airstrikes, we all know, cannot alone succeed to defeat Daesh. What we need are ground forces. Where are those 70,000 moderates? Why isn't Jordan... Saudi Arabia and Iran actually doing more. It is their responsibility to actually, given their scope as regional players, to do more. Where is the economic strategy? Why aren't we taking on Daesh from a, from a business and financial point of view? They are the richest terrorist group in the world. Why aren't we doing more? One more minute. Why aren't we doing more to address their prominence on social media? Where is the strategy in that? And why is it that we have refugee camps that are $800 billion, a million dollars underfunded? It is an international disgrace. There is no complete comprehensive strategy. And in the absence of that, the military intervention would only make things worse, as previous interventions have shown. And if there's one thing in conclusion, I would suggest to you, when I was serving on the streets of Northern Ireland in the 1980s, it is this very point, and that is soldiers can only buy you time. The politicians and the diplomats must step up to the plate. Politically, we have failed so far. We've frozen out the Russians. We banned the Iranians. We stuck to the mantra that Assad must go in the short term. We still don't have a political framework. We still can't agree who should be in control in Damascus. It's time to raise our game. The politics are not in place. And therefore, I would urge you, in the absence of that long-term comprehensive strategy, and whilst accepting that we must abide by our responsibilities when it comes from a counter-terrorism point of view, 
the wider idea that we militarily intervene against Daesh, I think, is complete and utterly wrong. We have not learnt the lessons from the past, and I would urge everyone in this chamber tonight to ensure that they support the motion. And I thank you very much. <laughs>